talking about <coughs> fiscal sustainability in contemporary security sector reform. Her advisor is Professor Stephen Stepp. Yes. Um, hello, I'm Amanda Brockbank. Uh, I would like to thank, before I begin, the requisite thank yous to my advisor, Steve Sedman, who couldn't be here today, but he's been incredibly helpful through this process. Also, the number of people that I complained to about Somalia for the last 14 months is pretty immeasurable. So I really am forever grateful for all of you people, Most, a lot of whom are sitting in this room and I could not have done it without you, particularly my father, who is all the way out here from Colorado. So thanks, Brad. Um, like Marcella said, I'll be talking today about an analysis of fiscal sustainability within the context of security sector reform. Just so you know, throughout this process, I might refer to security sector reform as SSR, just the abbreviation, just so if I do slip into that, I'll try and stick to the full, uh, full name, but just so you're aware. Okay, so this is a picture of Buzkashi. Uh, traditionally, I give this presentation with a video to show how violent it is, but Buzkashi is the national sport of Afghanistan, and it's played by taking a goat carcass from one end of the field to the other, and it's incredibly violent along the way. Uh, so with that framework, I want to bring you into the words of U.S. Army Captain Jason Hawk, who once said that security sector reform in Afghanistan is a lot like a Buzkashi match. <coughs> Lots of motivated people running around trying to grab the calf, then a ferocious scrum to determine whom to chase next. It seems to have no end, exhausts all the horses, leaves the riders bruised and broke, and it's hard to tell who's actually winning. <laughs> so that's a pretty alarming way to think about a process that received both a lot of political and financial will over most of our generation's uh, political memory. It also reveals that there's a lot to be learned about security sector reform, and despite the fact that it's important and it's new and it's relevant, uh, it's still, the kinks are still being worked out. And so we're going to be focusing on one of those particular kinks today, which has to do with fiscal sustainability in combination with political sustainability. So how do we end up with countries that are not bruised and broke, and how do we end up with better outcomes um, based on those two concepts? So in order to do that, we're going to start by discussing the problem, which will lead us to my central research question. We'll then move into methodology. I went through both a quantitative and a qualitative analysis. We'll spend a little bit of time on the qualitative analysis because it's important to understand everything, but most of this presentation will actually be focusing on the quantitative model that I built in order to bring these two concepts of political and fiscal sustainability together. That's sort of like the meat and potatoes of this presentation. Um, then we'll go into a Somali case study. The model is pretty hard to grasp, as a lot of people in the public policy program can understand. Um, they've heard me talk lots about this model a lot, so it's much easier to see in the context of an actual nation. So we'll bring it into the Somali case study. And finally, we'll end with some results and conclusions. Cool. So starting with the problem, um, first, what is security sector reform? It's a sort of buzzword that a lot of people are talking about in the international community, but especially for those outside of the international community, so multilaterals and donor nations, a lot of people don't know what security sector reform is. I'm about to show you a really dense definition. That's the UN definition, which is widely viewed as the best definition of security sector reform. But what's important is that there are two component parts to it. A logistical part, so the sort of process of security sector reform, and the goals. And they're both highlighted, and we'll go over what they mean, but I do just want to show you the sort of density of the way security sector reform is viewed these days. So there it is. Um, this first part, this first highlighted part, goes through the process. So as we see here, security sector reform is fundamentally logistical. It is the reformation and the reconstitution of the security sector, which is the army, the police, the justice sector, any group of people within a nation that is working to provide security to its people. It also, however, is part of a greater <coughs> goal. As we can see here, with, as this part that says, without discrimination and with full respect for human rights and the rule of the law, Security sector reform is actually a mechanism for political outcomes. So especially in recent years, particularly the last 20 years, it's become one part of state building, the state building process. And it's become a means for human rights and the rule of law and these other development goals that the international community sees as really key in pursuing. This is an incredibly important <laughs> paradigm to consider. And it is not bad at all, even though we're going to be talking about challenging it today. I do want to lay the groundwork that it's very important that political, or that security sector reform is political because it recognizes the tie between security and development, which is a very inherent tie that's only sort of come to popularity in the last 20 years. Um, but it has a number of consequences, one of which is this fiscal aspect. So in order to see what kind of consequence that is, we're going to go back to Afghanistan. So in Afghanistan, we spent $110 billion on the security sector reform. Just to give you a sense of scale, that's more than the entirety of the Marshall Plan. So that's a lot of money. Uh, perhaps even more relevantly, only 12% of that can be paid for by the Afghanis themselves. That means everything else is being supported by the international community. 
And while Afghanistan is an extreme case of this situation, it's not a unique case. We see it happening everywhere from Pakistan to Liberia, where the international community is coming into these developing nations, implementing security sectors that they just can't afford, that the local nation just can't afford, and then they're stuck paying for the security sector sort of into perpetuity. Um, but I wanted to know, really, was this problematic? And this kind of leads me to my central research question, which asks, first, should fiscal sustainability be factored into security sector reform at all? So does it matter that Afghanistan can only pay for 12%? So we first need to establish the requisite fact of, does this even matter at all? And second, if so, how can this be done without compromising political sustainability? Like I said, politics, very, very important. And so if we're going to bring fiscal sustainability into the picture, it needs to be operational, and it needs to be... Um, done in a way that can actually be used. So, moving on to my methodology, like I said, we're going to start with a little bit of qualitative analysis, beginning with the question of whether fiscal sustainability should be considered into security sector reform. And I'm going to go ahead and give away the ending here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, fiscal sustainability, it turns out, really, really matters. Um, traditionally, political sustainability, oh, my eyes, my eyes went away. Uh, fiscal sustainability and political sustainability have been considered as two separate entities. Like I said, the dominant paradigm places political sustainability in its own box. Uh, that's perpetuated by a lot of the literature as well as practitioners. A lot of interviews with people at the UN and the World Bank found that polit political sustainability is a sort of be-all, end-all of security sector reform. And that means that fiscal sustainability gets left as aspirational or sort of secondary. And, and that's really problematic, it turns out, because as I find in my thesis, Fiscal sustainability is actually key to political sustainability. And political sustainability, so these ultimate political outcomes of rule of law and human rights and these lofty goals, are dependent on fiscal sustainability. So if we're not considering fiscal sustainability, we're actually undermining the goals that we're setting to begin with. So it's really important because it's by definition key to attaining the goals. Um, there are a couple of different ways this happens. I'm going to highlight two here. We can talk about them more in detail in the questions if you have questions about them, but I'm just going to go over them quickly. One is through altered incentives. So this occurs when a nation is going through a security sector reform, an external nation or body comes in and starts paying for this very expensive security sector. The local nation has no incentive to take over that expensive security sector because it's being handled by the international community without real regard for price. Um, and then the international body has no incentive to give the power over to the local government and the local power and authorities because they're not going to be able to handle it because they have are voting their reasons of story. So it's a pretty vicious cycle that leads to the international community propping up a security sector. Um, the second one is something called the cliff. So this is what we see in Afghanistan. And the cliff is a colloquial term, uh, but it's pretty well referred to. So the cliff is when they've moved past this altered incentives issue and the international community is gone, but they can't support their own security sector and they're reliant on an external body. And this is not only problematic because, again, it means that the international community is propping up a security sector. It also means that there's not room in the budget to pay for other development measures. So. Security is by no means the only part of the development budget. Uh, there's a lot of other things that have to go into it, but if they're paying so much for their security sector that they, they can't afford the other things, that's also deeply problematic. Um, so that brings us sort of into, oh, oh goodbye, <laughs> into the second question, which is how can this be done without compromising political sustainability, which is really where we begin to see this operationalize. Um, it's nice if we can say that it's important, but that moves us no farther in the conversation because, again, it continues to be potentially aspirational. So my objective, oh, my bracket is also messed up. <laughs> this is what happens, I guess. So my objective was to create a fiscal sustainability model that is operational within a nation's political context. So the goal was to create this model that could be used anywhere from Colombia to Somalia in order to integrate and condense their security sector reform process and bring together both the political goals and the fiscal goals. And in order to do so, um, I went through sort of a three-step process that I'm going to go over broadly right now, and then we'll really delve into it through the rest of this presentation. So this started with a theory of change. A theory of change is this very trendy thing in the nonprofit world right now. Um, it's all about linking a mission to tangible actions to create, um, to ultimately achieve that mission. This then leads to an establishment of the security needs paired with macroeconomic projections and then ultimately leads to a politically rooted cost versus revenue comparison, just to give you a broad sense of what this model does and what the whole process went through. Um, so beginning with the theory of change, like I said, really trendy in the nonprofit world, but it's actually being picked up pretty significantly in the inter international development world. So there's reason to believe that a theory of change will be really successful within the security sector reform um, realm. So the idea is to start out with a broad goal. 
In the case of security sector reform, the broad goal is always going to be security. It's always going to be both external security, so protection from threats, but also political security. So getting back to some of those initial political goals that we talked about will always be what we're aiming for. Security, in turn, is then compromised by a number of threats. So that could be an external body threatening war. It could be an interstate group. Um, it could be the risk of a coup. There might be any number of threats. So it's the goal of the person creating this model to go through a threat analysis and figure out what those threats are. Again, threat analyses are very common in the security and development world, and so this is a pretty, pretty normal step. Then, each threat is mitigated by a certain actor or sector. So this might be the army, the police, the justice sector, whatever it is, that's going to be who's best equipped to approach these threats. And by these actors approaching these threats, you're then attaining security, sort of the goal. So there's now a causal link between reforming one group of people and attaining security. So then that has to actually move to a model, right? That's a nice political theoretical discussion, but that again doesn't really move us forward in the policy conversations and the policy formation process. So in order to do so, um, you take the actor we just talked about. So let's say the army is this actor, this sector within the political group. The actor is broken up into wages, operations, equipment, infrastructure, and training. So these are all components that make the actor able to provide security. So the actor's capacity to do its job is dependent upon the provision of these factors, right? So then you take these factors and you break them up further into basic needs and high capacity demands. So in the case of an army, you have these things, and then at the baseline level, what that army requires to do its job. So without any extras, what is needed for that army? Um, and then from there, you're working up on the, high, on the high capacity demands, and this is really where the levers and the capacity to change the model come in. So the high capacity demands are what it would be if this army was really able to do its job very, very well. What would be required within these different categories? So you're seeing really baseline levels and then some extra added costs that allow for mitigation of certain threats and um, enhanced security. So the model functions by first determining the, the total costs. So you input the number of personnel in each sector each year, so the number of soldiers, the number of police officers, the number of um, judges, things like that, and then those will correlate to the baseline costs. So within that, you're given the lowest possible level of costs for that number of people. You then can determine the number of these people that are equipped at a high capacity, which will then convert to the added costs. So you end up with these total costs based on the baseline, and then you can mess with the number of people at a high capacity. So you might be able to try out what if the full army is given the highest set of um, security, or what if only half of it, what if none of it, and that allows you to essentially do a cost-benefit analysis between what is the cost of adding more people with higher capacity versus the benefit of the security you attain. You then compare this to macroeconomic projections. And that allows you to put in the resource constraint to see exactly what you're working against and what these costs mean in context. So that was a lot, I totally understand. It's also an Excel sheet that's been translated to a PowerPoint. So we're gonna put it in the context of Somalia so you can sort of get a sense of how this works. And that'll help lead us to some of the conclusions so you can see why this is actually a useful, a useful model. So when a lot of people think of Somalia, they think of maybe this, this is a nice militant group. Um, you think of probably some pirates, maybe the famine that occurred, but interestingly, in the international community, Somalia is seen as a real source of hope. So this is most notably in um, John Kerry's most recent visit to Somalia. He was the first Secretary of State to visit Somalia, and he said to them, I visited Somalia today because your country is turning around. And this is due in part to a constitutional process and security sector reform that's happened. So security sector reform is a really key part of this hope that is emblemized by people like John Kerry's visit. Um, however, Somalia is also ripe for discussion of issues of fiscal sustainability. Somalia spends a comparatively large amount of its budget on security. As you can see here, they are far exceeding other benchmark countries on how much of their budget they're spending on their military in particular. At the same time, they have an incredibly low revenue as a percent of GDP. So this just shows that they are spending a lot of money that they don't have on their security. So they really are in need of this sort of fiscal sustainability component. So Somali security, looking at our theory of change, which was the first step of this, is compromised by three main threats. Um, I do want to qualify this and say that Somali security is incredibly complicated. So these three threats are my own analysis based on a lot of other threat analyses and some World Bank and UN documents and interviews. Um, but there are a lot of ways this problem could be framed. This is for the sake of this analysis and for the sake of my model. So one, insurgencies and non-state actors. So this is primarily al-Shabaab is what we hear about in the news. 
regional and inner clan conflict, Somalia didn't really have a government for 20 years, and so security began to be provided by local groups, and then there was a lot of competition for power. So that's a huge threat right now. And then rule of law shortcomings. They currently operate under a traditional system of law called JIR, which is terrible for human rights and um, general rule of law. And so that's a huge threat to security there. Each of these is mitigated by a specific set of actors. So the SNA, the Somali National Army, helps take care of the insurgency. A regional armed police and a civilian police takes care of the regional and interplane conflict. And the courts and corrections, the criminal justice system, takes care of rule of law shortcomings. Again, if you want to talk about this specific choice, we can talk about it in the question section. But for the sake of time, I move forward. <laughs> So then the next step is determining the capacity of these various sectors that we've now determined. So the army, the regional armed police, the police, and the criminal justice system. So I'm going to give an example of this through the Somali National Army so that you can see how this works. But this is the process that you go through with every single sector. So here's a table with our nice component categories on the side, um, the same ones we talked about before, and the baseline and high capacity levels that we also talked about before. So every single soldier receives these baseline operation and wages. And so you might say there's 10,000 members of the Somali National Army. They're all going to be calculated as this cost. However, then you have this lever of saying how many soldiers are going to get the high capacity. And they're going to get these added costs of the equipment, infrastructure, and training. So the costs come from the fact that you're having these baseline soldiers, and then you're changing the number of high capacity soldiers, which ultimately these soldiers are going to be way better equipped to provide security, but they're also going to be way more expensive. So again, coming back to the cost-benefit analysis concept. So then you compare that to macroeconomic projections. Um, naturally, a place like Somalia, as well as a lot of these post-conflict nations, are really economically volatile, which means that it's really hard to say that this is exactly where their GDP or their revenue will, their revenue will be in 10 years. Um, the, a good number for GDP for Somalia actually only emerged in the last two years. So this is a really tough art for a lot of these countries. So what I've done is I've broken down the revenue scenarios into three different scenarios. Um, a lower revenue scenario, so this is where the, ra the ratio of the <laughs> revenue to GDP is held constant at the levels they're currently at, so that's pretty low. A moderate revenue scenario, which is kind of seen as the most likely option, um, which is where there's linear growth based upon the average rate of growth for the last three years, so we're seeing progressive growth but not immense growth. And then a high revenue scenario, which is where um, the Somali government or the Somali economy will grow at the same rate as that of Somaliland, which is a semi-autonomous region in the north of Somalia that's been incredibly successful developmentally. So if Somalia is successful economically, it will probably follow a trajectory that, like that of Somaliland. Um, this also accounts for the fact that the economy is dependent in part upon security, right? If the security sector and the security system is doing really, really well, the economy will probably boost as well and vice versa. And so this allows you to sort of see some of the ranges that might occur in costs. So that's the way the model, it all comes together on this big Excel sheet, um, and then it outputs graphs. And I'm about to show you a graph. Again, I want to explain it a little bit before we go into it, because um, it's a little complicated. So the value of this model is in policy discussions. It's in me as a security sector reform actor, or a member of the UN, talking with another member of the UN and trying to figure out what security sector, the future of the security sector might look like. This is pretty hard to show you in um, a presentation in the middle of college campus. So what I've done is simulated three possible scenarios that are reasonable based on a lot of uh, multilateral assessments for Somalia's future. So scenario one is the really, really baseline level costs. So it's pretty much the minimum provision of security in Somalia that's reasonable based upon the scenario or based upon the capacities that we've given. Scenario two is slightly above that and scenario three goes right above that. So that all comes together against the revenue projections to look at a graph like this. So the bars represent the scenario costs. So um, here we have the different costs associated with them, and then the lines are the revenue projections. So initially, what things we see from here is that in the short term, there are huge economic problems with all three scenarios. One of the things that's really important to remember on this graph is that, again, the security sector only represents a part of the budget. So the fact that this early on, the security sector is even exceeding revenues as one part of the budget is really, really problematic. Um, things look to get better in the long term, but again, I want to bring you back to this notion that the security sector is only part of an entire budget. And so if you look at the lowest cost scenario, so scenario one in 24 and 2024 and 2025, as compared to even the highest revenue scenario, this is actually still an unreasonable percentage of the security sector as per the same benchmarks we were using before. So it still exceeds the international comparators for what security sectors should be as part of a greater budget 10 years down the line from now. 
Um, this has massive policy implications for the international community in the sense that they can no longer abide by the status quo. This demands a conversation about strategy in terms of how to make sure that Somalia is still getting the security they need without being reliant on the international community into perpetuity. Um, and one thing I do want to note here is that this graph is not an optimization graph. The model is not an optimi optimization model. It's not meant to tell you what the best policy is because that's going to change depending on priorities, depending on threats, depending on country contexts. What it does is it shows you the implications of different policy options in terms of cost. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to interpret this, but it does, this is the first grounding that the, the international community can have in this kind of subject. There are also some general policy implications and conclusions that I do want to talk about. So um, first, we find that fiscal sustainability really does matter. And while I kind of joked about it at the beginning, this is something pretty new. Um, the current paradigm is that it doesn't really matter. And so this suggests a shifting of the paradigm in the way we think about security sector reform generally. Second, it suggests that that fiscal sustainability really can be integrated in. There's not a really good reason why it shouldn't be, given that it is possible to operationalize this. Certainly this model isn't perfect, but um, it does show that there is a way to bring it into the conversation in a way that doesn't compromise political sustainability, which was the fear of a lot of the people at the UN that I talked about, was that ultimately we were going to be making cost-cutting measures at the uh, cost of human lives, which obviously nobody wants. Um, there are also a couple other surprises about the model that I didn't really realize were going to be useful about it. But the first one is transparency. So in a place like Somalia, where it's especially clear, but this is true of other places as well, um, information is really fragmented. So if you look at the Somali budget, the equations are literally made up. Um, it's almost all fudged. It's not really a legitimate source. And when there are funding decisions being based upon those numbers, and if they're all combined into one place, the government has an incentive to provide accurate numbers. So with Somalia, things like the model actually incited the government to provide more information about off-budget revenues. Um, so this kind of thing can be a real, real catalyst for transparency and for better governance structures on the whole. Second, integration. One of the things that came up over and over again um, when I was talking to people at the UN is that security sector reform often encompasses a lot of different stakeholders and there are a lot of different people involved. That's countries, that's multilaterals, that's private actors, things like that. And there's little discussion between them about their goals. And so the creation of a theory of change and the model generally requires a discussion of what the goals of the security sector reform are and the way they interact with each other, um, which is something that is ultimately useful and can enhance the outcomes of the overall process. So that's all I have for you. I'm going to guess there are some questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> question, cost will certainly vary. And so in that sense, all of my information about Somalia is sourced mostly from local documents, but wherever possible from other, uh, hopefully East African nations, but otherwise Sub-Saharan African nations, because they're sort of having access to the same markets. And so, for example, an MRAP um, costs many, many hundreds of thousand dollars in America, but you can get used MRAPs from South Africa that were used during apartheid area for $65,000 um, if you're in Somalia. So it allows you to sort of, so yes, unit costs definitely do matter. And in that sense, whenever the model is being created, using locally sourced documents is really important. Where those aren't available, there are definitely international benchmarks. So like the training costs that I provided here um, is an international benchmark for it. And then to, to your second question, I'll be with you in just a second. Um, percentages, I use percentages because that's what matters to the country itself. And so when you're looking at the budget of the country, ultimately, this is for the sake of the international community because we don't want the international community to be supporting governments all over the world into perpetuity. But the point is to say, how does the government itself of the nation pay for their own security? And so that's reflective of their overall GDP and their overall um, intake of resources. Yes? Um, Amanda, um, just a really basic question about mm -hmm. definition of security. Yeah. Yes. So 
I'm not totally clear on what counts as security. So would Maoist China be a secure place <laughs> or contemporary Mexico? Or um, so it sort of depends. But in my interpretation, no. That sort of threatens the political sustainability aspect of it. Maoist China is really, really repressive. So the notion of the security sector actually extends to civil society organizations in a lot of, in a lot of places. Because um, one of the things that is trying to be promoted is international standards of rule of law, and international standards of human rights, and those are things that are compromised there. So the notion of security does encompass that, like political security and that political sustainability aspect as well. And so that's one of the things I really wanted to preserve in my model, was to consider things like that. So if I was doing security sector reform in Maoist China, one of the things I would probably look at is the repression of human rights and how civil society organizations play into that, um, which doesn't have to do with the army necessarily despite the fact that they may be safe technically from international threats. So it goes beyond just feeling safe. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's what I was talking about, the importance of tying security and development and, and expanding our notion of security, which is really something that only happened in the sort of late, the early 1990s, was the world began to see that security is not just um, feeling a free of violence. There's a lot more in, in that definition. And, and it's technically encompassed as human security is the very jargony term for that same notion. Yes? Good job. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I really like the way you framed this. I mean, it, yeah. uh, and Afghanistan's got an unaffordable security system. Yes. And that has tremendous implications, as you laid out really well. If you do work for multilateral development bank, I mean, what people tend to to teach you is you do not build a road that cannot be maintained within the, the maintenance budget of the country. It's throwing money away. Equally, you don't build a school if they can't pay the wages of the teachers who are going to be in the school. So those sorts of fiscal questions are uppermost in the mind of people who support development programs. Um, and that should be the case in security as well. I, was, I haven't thought about it very much, and I really appreciate the chance to learn something from you. You made the comment about, and this is sort of horrifying, about the cost of human life. Now, roads can clearly be designed better or worse, right. and engineers know that if you design it more cheaply, more people will die in traffic accidents, and there are implicit human life costs. So my question relates to your three lines. What uh, in your, uh, you know, great, now you do have in there, I presume, that greater security means fewer human lives lost. Yes. What's the cost? The cost of a human life. Yes. Um, so this actually doesn't <laughs> consider the cost of a human life because it's not including those sort of like implicit costs of it. It's literally the physical costs of only the security sector. So you don't, you can't tell me, for example, how much, how f how many fewer lives will be lost if we go for the. The, the high quality security regime versus the low quality. No, that's nearly impossible to predict, particularly in, on a 10 year horizon. It's almost impossible but to why, say. Why would we go with the high cost one then if, uh, if we can't really see the benefit? Because you, it's particularly threat based. So, for example, in the case of Somalia, you might say um, so, Somalia is predicting the reduced influence of Al Shabaab in the next five years. They're currently an asymmetric force, but we're seeing that and the transition out of the international forces. But there's reason to believe that we should be accounting for the fact that Al-Shabaab is not just going to go away in five years, right? That's a pretty optimistic way to view what has turned out to be a really powerful terrorist group. So you might say that we need the higher costs because we need to account for threats like Al-Shabaab in the future. And so that's that cost-benefit analysis of saying these are the human lives we're going to save. And this isn't to say that the international community, this isn't to make the policy decision for them. It's just to say that if we're going to fund this higher cost, we need to be able to justify it and say it's with regard to this threat that we see on the horizon, or and it's it does place an implicit value on a human life. So if we're going to keep their budget about a quarter of security budget, about a quarter of the budget, um, would it make sense for the UN, which currently intervenes on occasion with peacekeepers, should they have a sort of SWAT team <laughs> that when the when the uh, terrorists take over in the country, they can sort of shoot in? Um, to I supplement mean, the security apparatus that exists? <laughs> I mean, they definitely they definitely could. One of the things that I found really interesting in discussion of the thesis with um, the director of policy planning for the Office of Political Affairs works here, and it's pretty phenomenal. And she was talking to me about the way that security sector reform, in its most purest, fiscally sustainable way, is actually a preventative action, right? It, it should be going in beforehand and making sure that they're equipped to handle that. Um, so one implication of that might be that the UN's role is to go in ahead of these big 
insurgencies, fix the security sector, and then only have this sort of small peacekeeping type operation. Um, again, that would probably, I don't know what the exact cost of a peacekeeping mission are, they're pretty high, I do know that. So that is one consideration, certainly, um, that could be an implication of this kind of analysis. Very interesting stuff. Yeah. I think we've run out of time for questions.